None of us will experience a life where we're not challenged, but it matters how we respond. Today, His Eminence Bishop Omega delivers another inspiring message titled, How to Resist Sin. Be uplifted and blessed. Peace be unto you all and praise the Lord. I have been going over recently Old Testament uh, references, and as I like to always say before we get into the Old Testament, the purpose of the Old Testament is clearly delineated for us in the New Testament. Romans 15.4 tells us that the Old Testament is there for our learning so that we may be encouraged by it, we may learn patience, we may learn how the saints of old dealt with things so we'll know better how to either resist sin, which is our topic today, or how to overcome and put up with uh, perils and troubles in life and how to endure, how to uh, learn to be a godly person. That's what the Old Testament is there for. Many things can be gleaned from it, but what we've been using it for recently is to show us that you're not the first to go through what you're going through. We have examples in the scripture. And uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 11 and Romans 15, 4, please read that so you'll see that when we go over these Old Testament scriptures, it's for a reason. Today, I'd like to do uh, one uh, story, cover a story that everyone is familiar with virtually, that deals with uh, sin. Now, in our example today, we're going to be dealing with the sin of a sexual nature, although that is not the emphasis today. Today is how to deal with sin or how to resist sin in general. But you all know the story of Joseph. He was tempted by his boss's wife. And there comes the sexual connotation in. But let me tell you this. Any sin, any sin is obviously a sin against God because it wouldn't be a sin unless God said, don't do it. So though we're using this example today of Joseph, and I want to give a little background so for those that are not familiar with the story, do not be perturbed and turned off and say, oh, here he goes again talking about sexual immorality, sexual impropriety. Well, because the scripture does. But what we're gleaning from this particular reference today is not so much the sexual aspect, it's the aspect of sin, period, and how to resist sin. And I want to highlight about six different points about how to resist sin. That's the title, How to Resist Sin. Let's keep it simple today. And if you would learn uh, to listen to what the Scripture is teaching us and not be so uh, taken aback with the content of the story, that is to say the subject matter, because it revolves around a woman tempting a younger man to lie with her. That's the story today of Joseph. But I want to see, I want to show today through the scripture how Joseph successfully resisted sin. But let's say you, someone, is a thief. You apply the same principles to resisting thievery. Let's say someone is an abuser. You apply the same principles to uh, not abusing someone, whatever the sin is, sin is. If you're disrespectful to your parents, you apply the same principles that we're going to cover today. And those are, if you're, if you're those of you that are note takers, the first thing we're going to look at is don't make excuses for sin. Don't make excuses for it. You take responsibility uh, for your own actions. So don't make excuses for sin. The second is recognize sin as sin. Recognize it for what it is. If it's sin, it's wrong. Recognize that it is sin. The third thing, respond to God. When you're confronted with a sin, I always tell you this, put God in it. How does this look to God? As good as God has been to you, this is how you would treat him? You would just give in so easily to sin? Respond to that sin by throwing God in it. I just put respond to God. And the fourth thing is, don't make yourself available for sin. Believe it or not, we're going to see in this story how Joseph did these very things. Don't make yourself available. Just refuse to be present. Don't make yourself available. If you know a, a particular situation is about to happen, don't make yourself available. And let's say you couldn't avoid it. You just are confronted with unavoidable circumstances where sin has confronted you and the circumstance is now unavoidable. Well, don't just walk away casually 
run, flee, as the Bible tells us, to flee from sin. And then the sixth is be willing, be ready to suffer the consequences for resisting sin. If there are some earthly punishments or penalties or something coming from your earthly authorities, whatever, be ready to suffer that, but I'm not going to sin against God. So you can have two bosses or two masters. You can have an earthly authority over you, and then you also, you know you have the heavenly authority over all. Let that be the reason why you don't sin. That's your sixth uh, uh, consideration. Be willing to suffer whatever it is just to honor God. So as we cover this story, look for these six particular things that are employed here in this, in this story of Joseph. Now, for those of you that may not be familiar with the story of Joseph, he was, if you will, the favorite son of his father. And he was the son of his father's favorite wife, Rachel. And, of course, Rachel and Benjamin came, I'm sorry, uh, Joseph and Benjamin came from Rachel. And the other children came from uh, Leah, Rachel's uh, older sister, and some concubines. But for the sake of the, uh, condensing the story, Joseph's brothers got jealous of him because dad favored him. And they threw him into a pit and sold him. They threw him in a pit and, and told the, went back and told the father that an animal ravaged him and killed him. And they said, see, here's his coat, the special coat that dad made for him to show that he was special. And look, see, they put animal blood on him and say, see, look, dad, see, he died. And it just destroyed the father emotionally. And so the sons, the other sons lied and uh, deceived the father and the father thought Joseph was dead. So they threw him into a pit and then a, a caravan or a troop of uh, Ishmaelites, today we would call them Arabs or Midianites, they were passing by. They, the brothers, rather than kill their brother Joseph, some wanted to kill him, but I believe it was Reuben said, no, let's not kill him, the oldest brother. So they sold him into slavery. And they sold him as a slave to these passing uh, Ishmaelites, Arabs. Today they would be uh, people from the Saudi Arabia region, Kuwait, that region. They're from that region. So they sold them to some Ishmaelites. And the Ishmaelites took Joseph down into Egypt. And when in Egypt, the Ishmaelites sold him to Potiphar. Potiphar is, if you will, the prime minister or the number two fella in Egypt after Pharaoh. He's uh, the commander of all of Pharaoh's uh, forces and he, he runs Egypt, if you will, second to Pharaoh. So he's a very powerful man. And we are gonna pick up the story here where the Joseph is now taken down into Egypt. But I want us to keep in mind those six points that I just made about the principles of resisting sin. Remember, let's, let's go over them quickly again. You first of all, you take responsibility for the fact that what you're about to engage in or could engage in is sin. The second thing is you recognize sin for what it is. It's sin, it's wrong, it's wicked, it's against God. Third, respond to that by keeping God in mind. Respond to God when you're resisting sin. And fourth, don't make yourself available for sin. Fifth a point we want to cover is when you're unavoidably confronted with sin, there's no way out. I see sin is going to confront me. And you'll see how in Joseph's story, once he was able to get away from it, but now there comes a time when you may be unavoidably directly confronted with it. So run, don't walk from it. And the sixth point we're making today is be willing, be ready to suffer whatever I have to suffer in this earthly human realm, not to sin against God. And before I get started, let me just say, no, I have not always employed these. I still don't all the time because you can sin in thought as well. But as, as someone would say, but it's hard when you're young. Well, we're dealing with a young man here who was 17 years old, who was confronted with something which is very difficult for teenagers whose hormones are jumping like pistons, but he does respond to God. He does use these various principles that we just went over in order to keep himself from sin. Why am I saying all of that? Because it is possible, while it may be difficult, oftentimes to resist sin, and especially when the allure, when the, when the lure is a, of a, a physical or sexual nature is for a young person, old or young, but especially young people, it may be quite difficult, often is. 
But here is what we do because we find it in Scripture. Again, Romans 15, 4 and 1 Corinthians 10, 11 tells us these stories were not there just to entertain us, but they're there as examples for us. They're there to teach us how to not make the mistakes of those of the past. You know, how to triumph in God and live for God. So we're going to begin here at the first verse of the 39th chapter of Genesis. We're way back in the first book of the Bible, Genesis, which means the beginning. So here we are in the 39th chapter where Joseph is now taken down into Egypt and sold to Potiphar. And I'll read again the new King James Version. I'm sure many of you have the classical King James, which I may refer to sometimes. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him uh, from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. Now verse 2, the Lord, this is very crucial, saints, understand this. The, the key to the whole life of Joseph is found in these words. The Lord was with Joseph. That's very important to remember. The Lord was with Joseph. And before we get to this, before we go further, I want you to appreciate this. How God has blessed Joseph was in Joseph's head. What, what made him able to resist sin was Joseph, I said, respond to God. Joseph always kept in mind how he was favored by God, how he was blessed by God. You may not feel that you are a Joseph today, but if you are, first of all, in the body Christ, you have been so blessed by God, you may not have any idea of the full extent of that. That of all of humanity that has ever been on earth, God has chosen you to be with him. This must resonate in your head. So you may say, but I, my, I don't have my rent. Um, my car is old. Uh, I don't have friends. Uh, I want a wife. I don't have this. I want... You have been blessed and you have forgotten scripture. When Paul asked for something, the Lord told him, I saved you. That's enough. And by that he means my favor, my grace on you is enough for you. So when I say Joseph reckoned on or remembered the fact that he has been so blessed by God, he never let that leave his head. And this is the key to understanding the whole life of Joseph. He was always aware that the Lord was with him. And that took and takes today some kind of faith in God to know that beyond my doubt, beyond my questioning, beyond my not knowing everything, there's something I have in me that I know the Lord is with me. And that's the key to success, to a successful life in, in this particular life that we live now. Now, Joseph had been taken down to Egypt and uh, Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. This is the key to Joseph's life right here. The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous or successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Notice the Lord was with him, and that's the reason he was always successful. Now, this doesn't mean there weren't perils in his life. Don't forget, the Lord is with him, but how is the Lord blessing me if I'm a slave? Joseph was just sold into slavery by his own brothers. There you are, betrayed by family, people who should have been protecting and looking out for him. The only one that wasn't in on that was the Benjamin, his baby brother, his younger brother. All his older brothers turned against him and sold him into slavery. But here we see he was blessed. The Lord was with him. This you have to keep in mind when whatever you're going through right now, but the Lord is still with you. The Lord is with you. And the Lord's with Joseph, and, the, and he was a, a successful man in all that he did because the Lord was with Joseph. And he was in the house of his master, his earthly master, obviously. And we would say today he was in the house of his boss. And if, if you hear me today say, use the word boss, understand back then it was slave and master. Even the New Testament, which tells us to uh, servants obey your masters. The word there is slaves obey your masters. That's what they were then. So employees obey your employer is what they're saying. Now, of course, you're going to see in this story, it means 
as long as they don't force you or cause you to sin. Serve them as though you're serving the Lord. But he's not a very kind or nice personality sort of person. Is it your employer? Is he your boss? Or is she your boss? Is she your employer? Then obey her. But do not go so far as to follow that boss or that employer, that master, that earthly man, into sin. That's the cutoff line. Other than that, the Lord clearly tells us in, in Scripture to listen to or obey your employer. I believe it is uh, Ephesians 6, 5 and Colossians 3, 22. You're told to obey your employer. Show them respect. And then when you work for them, work as though you're working for Jesus. Now, the obvious limitation to that is when they try to cause you to sin, as we're going to see in this particular story. So he was in the house of his master, his earthly master. Verse 3, Genesis 39. And his master saw that, now listen to this, his master saw that the Lord was with him, was with Joseph, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. What is this saying? Even his boss noticed that he was good on the job. Listen to this. Now, this doesn't mean, uh, this is not the point yet where Joseph has put over everything. Joseph, if you will here, let me uh, amplify by uh, having done research, Joseph now was just working in general for Potiphar. Could have been out in the field, could have been with the goats, could have been with the sheep, could have been with the animal, whatever he was doing, he was working, he was employed by, or he was a slave of actually, uh, Potiphar, but he was not yet made second in command to Potiphar in the house. But listen to this, this means he's just working in general. Anything that uh, Potiphar put him over, he did well. And this is saying something for us too today, today saints. Have a good reputation on the job. Be known as that employee who is there on time or early. Be known as the one who works most diligently. The Lord blessed Joseph, the Lord was with Joseph, and even his boss saw that anything this man touches, don't forget he's only 17 when he's sold into slavery, but anything that Joseph had the charge of was successful because the Lord was with him. Verse 4, so Joseph found favor or grace, in the sight, in his boss's sight, and served him, and he served his boss. Now, after working so successfully for Potiphar, after Potiphar seeing his boss, seeing that this man, this young man works well, and he's probably doing laborious work because the, the scripture says later that he was not only handsome, but he was in very good shape, so he's probably doing very physical things, and that's one reason that the wife tried to come on to him, most likely, but he's just doing jobs all around the, the property, and then, now listen to this, then he made him, Potiphar made Joseph, overseer of his house, and all that he had he put under his authority. Everything, see, let's go back over this. Notice this, the man is such a dutiful worker, he worked so diligently and, and, and uh, was on time and did things so well and put his mind and effort into his work that he got noticed by his boss, by his master. So he noticed that this young man can take responsibility. Even Jesus says at a certain place, that those of you that are good with a little bit, I'll give you a lot. So Joseph made himself known that that's a worker. He does what you ask. And Joseph probably did more than he was asked. He did it well. So much so that Potiphar said, everything I have, I'm putting under this young man. This young man is good with whatever you give him to do. And we have to glean from this at the inference here that he was already just working common jobs and common, he was doing common responsibilities he had. But now the boss, Potiphar, saw that he was so good, he says, I want this man to run everything, of my, all of my property, my whole house, the fields, the goats, the animals, and inside the house. So Joseph had a way of uh, keeping himself that he was ob obviously decent, he was honest, forthright, he had a good reputation on the job. And that's very important for us today. Well, whomever you work for, the Bible says work as though you're working for the Lord. But get, have a good reputation on the job. The Lord is with you. Then he made him overseer over his, uh, of his house, and all that he had he put under him, under Joseph, under his authority. Verse 5. So it was from the time that he had made him overseer of his house and all that he had that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house. The Lord blessed the Egyptian's house 
uh, for Joseph's sake. Because Did you see that? The Lord is blessing this pagan because of Joseph. And Joseph got elevated because the Lord is with Joseph, and Joseph didn't take it for granted. Joseph knows, and you'll see in, in, as we read on through the life of Joseph, you'll see Joseph always kept in mind, I owe God. I owe God. Every one of us, every one of you listening to me right now, we owe God. We owe him a righteous living life. We owe him uh, the sweat of our brow when we're working. We owe him diligence. I owe him the respect to get his word right when I preach it. We all owe him the respect to live his word once we hear it and we are taught by the Holy Spirit. You owe God. I owe God. Joseph knew this. And you'll see his integrity was tied up in this. I owe God, is his whole thought. God is with me. So it was from the time, verse 5, that he had made him, that Potiphar had made Joseph overseer of his house and all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. Did you see that? The Lord blessed not only all that was in Potiphar's house, but also his goats, his crops, his, his uh, animals, his uh, oxen, whatever he owned. The Lord blessed everything that his boss had because of Joseph's sake. And Joseph showed his boss, who's a pagan, does not believe like he does, because for them, Pharaoh was God. But Joseph worshiped and, and lived for his God, the one true God. And the Lord blessed the pagan because of Joseph's sake, because Joseph loved God, because Joseph was dutiful and responsible and faithful to the Lord God, the Lord blessed the man he worked for as a slave. Isn't that something? Uh, where are we now? Verse 6. Thus, and verse 6 now we're going to see that I just said he had a great reputation at work. Listen to this, how the, the, the word puts it. Thus he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he did not, this is Potiphar, did not know what he had except the bread uh, that he ate. Meaning, Potiphar didn't concern him, didn't even realize all of what he owned, because Joseph took care of it that well. He didn't have to worry about it because he trusted Joseph, because Joseph proved himself to be honest. And the only thing he concerned himself with, really, was, what am I going to eat today? He did, now, is that an employee or a slave? Is that someone dutiful? Joseph made his boss to feel, I have everything so covered, sir, that all you have to worry about is what do you feel like eating? And of course, any personal responsibilities, I'm sure you, you know, I got to wash myself, what clothes I'm going to wear today. But he didn't have to, he didn't even know all of what he owned, but because Joseph took care of it all so well. That the Bible, the Bible says here, Joseph's reputation on the job was so good, verse 6, that all the boss concerned himself with is, what am I going to eat today? Now that's some kind of responsible, responsibility to your work. Where, and I tell you, I know many saints who are like this today, good workers. And I encourage you to stay like that and get even better. But every believer in Jesus should have such a reputation on the job that everyone, not just the boss, your co-workers, everyone knows, oh no, no, she's good, she's honest, she's on time, she's fair. You can leave your purse, she's not a thief, she doesn't, no, 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 if anything, she'll put money in your, uh, your purse for you. She has a good reputation, where people will say, I don't have to worry about anything around this person. I said, what are we gonna do for lunch today? So this, this Joseph, saying, why am I saying that? He's a slave. But he's so, he's so in such connection with God that he knows I'm being blessed, my master's being blessed because of his love for God and how he works it out in his daily lifestyle. He works hard. He has shown that he cares about his reputation. So much so that this man, this pagan who bought him, who owns him in the carnal sense, in the natural sense, of course God owns him, but he's saying, the, the, the word is telling us here, this man, Joseph, this young man, he's only 17 when he's sold into slavery, is so good that his pagan boss, master, doesn't have to concern himself with anything in that house. That's how much he trusts him. The only thing this man even thinks about considering is, what am I going to eat today for breakfast or lunch or dinner? He's made this man's life so easy to live 
that God has, and, and, and God has blessed him such that all his boss has to worry about is what he's going to eat. Now, Joseph, now I like the way this, the Lord throws this in here at the end of uh, verse 6. And I'm reading the modern King James. Now, Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. That means Joseph was well-structured, probably from all the physical work he was doing before he became overseer over everything. Joseph was out there, so he's in shape. And, you know, back then they didn't cover up like we do, so it's easy to see how cut he is. He's, he's in shape. And the Bible makes it very clear uh, he was a handsome fella. All of that is leading up to where we're getting to the temptation that's going to confront him. Now, verse 7, And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph and said to him, Lie with me, Joseph. Now, let's just break, it's clear what that says, but now let's just break it down. It came to pass after these things. This means after a period of time. Joseph is around the house working. The Egyptians back, it's hot in Egypt. And most of them barely wore clothing, so Joseph would have been like the rest of them, mostly exposed. She, the wife of the boss, Potiphar's wife, an Egyptian, and most, and listen, someone will say, that's not written in the Bible. Most people with common sense know that powerful men, especially as powerful as this man, most of them have attractive wives. So Potiphar's wife, in most cases, was probably very attractive. Now, someone will say, Bible, and I know these, uh, especially people who aren't very well read, and this is not an insult, but I mean, they say, well, the Bible doesn't say that. They just stick with what the Bible says. That's why I said, this may not be written specifically in the Bible, but you know from common sense that most powerful men tend to, they don't go out looking for the ugliest girl to marry. So in most cases, in most likely, it is most likely that Potiphar's wife was very attractive. No, it does not say that, but let me just put that in your ears. Now, it came to pass that she cast eyes on Joseph, meaning longing eyes. Now, notice here, she's just looking at him. And I'm saying this because when we get to part, the, the, the fifth principle about how to resist sin, that's different. But here, she casts eyes that just looks at him. And she just says to him, lie with me. She didn't sort of corner him yet. She perhaps passing by and looked at him and said, Joseph, lie with me, as we would say today, sleep with me, or, you know, let's not be graphic because we have children perhaps watching. So he says, lie with me. But now listen to this, saints. But he refused. Here is where I said, you do not make excuses for sin. Someone today may say, but if my attractive boss's wife said, lie with me, Ephesians 6, 5 says, obey your masters. She's my master's wife. Therefore, my mistress said, lie with me. Mistress meaning the female master. Uh, uh, Colossians 3.22 says, obey, servants, obey your masters. Where's this effect? Now, now, today people say, what could I do? See, that would be um, making excuses for sin. What could I do? It's the boss's wife. I'm just a slave. He didn't make excuses for why he could go on and sin. He could have easily done that. But listen to this. But he refused and said, now notice he's talking to her now. He refused and said to her, look, uh, my master does not know uh, what is with me in the house. Meaning, my master, your husband, doesn't even know all that he's put me over. And he has committed all that he has to my hands. There is no one of higher authority. There is no one greater in this house than I. Nor has he kept back anything but you. Why did he keep you back from? Because you are his wife. Now listen to this. How can I do this great wickedness, wickedness and sin against God? Look at what he just did. He did not make excuses for the sin. He said, I refuse. I can't do this. My master, your husband, has put me over everything. Now saints, there's a difference in saying to yourself, uh, well, what can I do? That's making excuse. She is the boss's wife, and she's my mistress. That's making excuse. He didn't do that. He took responsibility and said, the boss has put me over everything except you. Why? Because you're his wife. Now, here is why, where we get to the point of him recognizing that sin is sin. He said, it is great wickedness, and it's sin. He said, how can I do this sin against God? Now, this harkens back to... Uh, 
Abraham when Abimelech, the king of Gerar, tried to, uh, uh, wanted to, in fact, did take Sarah and was, had intentions of lying with her. Because in that day, if someone passed through your land and Abraham was passing through uh, uh, King Abimelech's land, you could take somebody's, uh, you could take a woman and bring them to the king unless that was his wife. But Abraham did tell an untruth. He lied and said, that's my sister. And remember, God came to Abimelech in a dream and said, you better not touch her. And because you didn't, that's why I won't kill you. But now don't touch her because it would be a sin against me, God said. Why am I saying this? Because not only adultery and fornication is sin, any sin, stealing is a sin against God. But when God himself recognizes in Genesis 6.20 with the Abimelech and Abraham case, God says it's a sin against me. And in 2 Samuel 12.13, David says, I have sinned against the Lord when Nathan made it clear that you've taken another man's wife. So I said today, our focus isn't so much today adultery and fornication as it is resisting sin. Because if you're a thief, still, that sin is against God. Because God said, thou shalt not steal. If you disrespect your parents, it's a sin against God. Because he said, honor your father and your mother. You get what I'm saying? So don't start getting uh, uncomfortable because in your, in your past you did this or did that with someone and you shouldn't have when you were married. I'm not on you today for that. My point here today is how to resist sin in general. If you've repented, sin no more, as the Lord says. But all sin is sin. So what uh, uh, Joseph does here is recognizes it as sin. He says it is great wickedness. Listen to this. How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So he's done two things. He's taken responsibility. He didn't make excuses. He took responsibility for his own actions. He says, if I do this, that would be wrong. And why would it be wrong? Because it would be great wickedness and sin against God. Therefore, he's recognizing it as sin, and he's also responding to God. You know, today... Uh, the world is so unlike God that, let's just take the sin now of fornication or adultery, that the world would make you feel weird for not succumbing to her seduction. I don't know if you know the story of this athlete called Tim Tebow. There was a, something I put on the, on the website there. Someone offered a million dollars for, for, for someone to take his virginity because he was a, apparently a college star, football player, and, you know, they're known to be very uh, active in their, in their, on their college campuses. And Tim Tebow, supposedly, I don't know the man personally, this is a story out there, says he's not going to have sex until he's married. And there was once an L.A. player also that did that. And what do people say? Man, you're weird. And then some accuse, they'll say, well, you must be a homosexual if you don't want to have a woman. But he says, no, I'm going to hold my virginity until I'm married. This may be controversial today, and a lot of people get uncomfortable when this subject comes up. But what you're doing, actually, when the Lord says, thou shalt not commit fornication, thou shalt not commit adultery, what you're doing is upholding what the Lord said. But the world today tells you you're weird. Well, you have to be willing to accept the consequences of standing up for what the Lord has said. And sometimes that may be ostracism by the world because the world will call you weird. And please don't think I'm being self-righteous. Someone's thinking, well, don't tell me, you never, ever. First of all, we're not here to discuss what I've done. We're here to learn how to resist sin. I and anyone else that have sinned have sinned, and it's wrong. So we're not making excuses for it. But my point is that when, sin, when you're confronted with sin, do this. Take responsibility for your own actions and recognize sin for what it is. It's sin. It's wrong, whatever it is. And then respond to God. Joseph realized that satisfying his own desires didn't mean as much to him as satisfying God. So Joseph says, I can't do this because you're my boss's wife, meaning you're married. God made it clear in Genesis 26, 20 verse 6, that you'd be sinning against God, Abimelech, if you have another man's wife. And David made it clear that he sinned against God when he took Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, in 2 Samuel 12, 13. So not trying to sound self-righteous here, but it's a matter of sin against God. Even someone uh, who uh, blasphemes the name of God, takes the Lord's name in vain, that's a sin against God. Our focus today is how to resist sin. Well, first of all, you take responsibility for your own actions. Don't make excuses. And then respond 
and, and then uh, also recognize, send for sin, and then respond to God, three. And then, listen to this, don't make yourself available. Listen to this. So it was, verse 10, as she spoke to Joseph day by day. Now, what does that mean? She kept coming on to him day after day after day. But you see, the first time she spoke to him, right? In verse uh, 8, but he refused. I'm sorry, in verse 7, she said, lie with me, Joseph. But in verse 8, he refused. But she just said it then. I'm saying that for a purpose because soon she's going to lay hands and he'll be confronted with unavoidable uh, sin. I mean, you know, he'll be confronted directly. So, so it was that she spoke to him day by day, verse 10, that he did not heed her and lie down with her. Now listen to this. Remember I said, don't make yourself available, nor to be with her. Now what does that mean? Let's just put it in, let's talk about, have a conversation here. What this is saying is if Joseph walked in the house and saw her over there, because she was doing day by day, she keeps approaching him. She could have been across the field, across the room, upstairs, downstairs. Joseph, lie with me. And he's going, no, ma'am. Joseph, lie with me day by day. Now, the, look at what this Bible says. It's very subtle here. Watch verse 10, part B, the last, latter part of verse 10. Uh, but he did not heed her to, to lie with her, listen to this part, nor to be with her, meaning he didn't make himself available. If he saw her, and perhaps he was going the same way that she, they may have crossed paths, he would go another way. See, he took it upon himself to not be available. He didn't make himself present. That's quickly stated, and it's subtle, but you have to look at these things that Joseph employed. This is the, the, the fourth thing I said. He's, look at what he's doing here. Joseph says, I know she's going to be in the house this time around lunchtime. I'm not going in there. Just don't be available. Because Let me read it again how the scriptures puts it. Uh, verse 10. So it was that as she spoke to Joseph day by day, this woman is hounding him. Day by day, he's confronted with this. Don't think it was a one-time, a one-off, as they say, or a one-time occurrence. This is day by day persistent. And he's confronted with the fact that she is my mistress, my female master. My, she is my mistress, so should I obey her? No, because it will be against God. So Joseph said, here's what I'll do. When I see her, I'm going to avoid her. I'm not going to make myself available. But you'll see as it happens, she cornered him, if you will, where he had to confront this, uh, this sin that she was tempting him with. But it says, I like this. This is the fourth thing we said. Do not make yourself available. Just don't be present when you know temptation is about to confront you. All of us have this in some way in our lives. You can be confronted with a certain weakness you have. Let's say your, your, your weakness is uh, smoking. Well, don't go hang around smokers. Now, that's, of course, a sin against your body. There's no scripture written against it. But listen, it's not wise, so just don't do it. But let's say your, your weakness is uh, sexual and someone you know is tempting you. Avoid that person. You say, but they're on the job. Avoid them on the job. And then get some resistance in you. Say, I'm responding to God, not to you. It's better for me to satisfy God than to satisfy my temporary pleasure. And don't think God is against pleasure. God's the one that gave us the pleasure desire. But he told us also the right way to fulfill it. He says there's an avenue for that. Get your own wife. Get your own husband. That's what the Lord says. Now, the Lord is not against us. Uh, he's not against pleasure, but he's against us getting caught in that trap of sin. You cannot help but admit this. Whenever there's infidelity in a relationship, somebody gets hurt. Either the other spouse, the children, you, somebody gets hurt. God's trying to help us avoid this by saying, hey, everyone have your own. And then have some self-control. If you're a thief, take the say, the Lord said don't steal. So consider the Lord said don't steal. It's not only that that wallet doesn't belong to you. It's laying there. He should have left it there. He's irresponsible. The money was in it. I took it. The Lord says, uh, the, the word is teaching us here, think about it. Do you know God is watching? You say you are Christian? You say you love the Lord? Don't you know he said, thou shalt not steal? When you bear false witness, when you lie on somebody, don't you know that you're sinning against God, not just the person you're lying against, and someone always ends up getting hurt? You have to respond to God. And then don't make yourself available for that sin. If people like getting on the phone and lying and gossiping, hey, when that person calls you, don't answer. 
If you know that's your weakness, you're going to get right into it. And you say, but I couldn't. This person had a higher rank than I did. This woman had a higher rank than Joseph. But what did he do? He would not be with her. He did not make himself available. Don't make yourself available for whatever sin it is. That's the fourth point. Let's go to verse 11 here in the 39th chapter. Again, what are we looking at? How to resist sin. And I can probably almost see some, of, some people squirming and some maybe rolling their eyes at the screen. And why is he always talking about this? I already said my focus today is not sexual immorality as much as it's sin in general. But if you're squirming in your seat and getting an attitude and getting upset, it's probably a good thing that the word is pricking your conscience. But let's move on, verse 11. But it happened about this time when Joseph went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the house were, uh, were inside that she caught him by the garment saying, lie with me. Now that's when I come to the point of the, the fifth thing that I mentioned. When you are unavoidably confronted with sin, see, she, before she just spoke to him, and day by day she only kept speaking, this time she grabs him. So this is unavoidable. You have to deal with her. Before he would see her coming and he wouldn't be available. He'd make him, he, he would not be with her. He just wouldn't be around her. This time is the circumstance that I spoke of when I said 1 Corinthians 6.18 says, flee. Do not hang around. Don't walk. And don't do this either. Girl, you know, if I wasn't, if it was any other opportunity, if, I, if, if you weren't married, see now, it's not time for that. Before, when he told her uh, that your husband has put me over everything, you are his wife, that was time for conversation. That was no contact. But now here's unavoidable, in your face, unavoidable confrontation or with sin. What does he do? And the scripture tells us. Don't stop and think about it. When you start making excuses, uh, I don't want to be offended, but if I, if I wasn't a married man, <laughs> you know I'd... No, 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 see, now you, you, that's uh, not the right thing to do. Now is no time for conversation. It's not time to start telling her about your faith. Well, my God says, no, she means to do something now. She grabbed him, which is another way of saying, now the sin is confronting you and, the, and it's unavoidable. You're confronted with it. You must make a decision. That's why the scripture tells us clearly, don't walk run. And he didn't say, uh, you know, I'm flattered, but you're a nice lady. No, it's no time for that. The time for that is over. Now you see she means to have you. And whatever it is, uh, whatever sin it is you're dealing with, when you see that there's no way around confronting it, here's what you do. Don't think about it. Don't rationalize. Don't begin to start preaching. Just run from it. The scripture makes it very clear what Joseph did. She grabbed him. She caught him by the garment and saying, lie with me, Joseph. But he left his garment in her hand and fled, ran outside. Meaning, she may have my garment. I'm not even thinking about that. Joseph is saying, I'm standing on my integrity. I'll be able to stand before God. I'll be able to stand before Potiphar, her husband. I'll be able to stand before anyone and say, as soon as she grabbed me, I ran. I did nothing against her. So his point, the, the point that the word is showing us here is when sin is right in your face and there's nothing you can do. I mean, if someone is luring you uh, to, or, or coaxing you to join them in doing something wrong, don't sit there and try to say, you know what, I would help you rob that bank, but, you know, I got to go be at work at five. No, 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 run. I don't rob banks. I'm not a thief. I don't help you uh, break into somebody's house. I don't help you beat up people, whatever the sin is. You avoid it quickly. If you're tempted to disrespect your parents, leave the room. Do not do that. Whatever God said, don't do. Just avoid the circumstance that would put you in it. Now, here was an unavoidable confrontation, and he did not casually step away. He ran. Now, what would the world say? Oh, man, he's weak. Any man would have, and look how we start, the world starts justifying. Any man would have said, listen, it's the boss's wife. It's not my fault. She forced me. I had to obey. Doesn't the Bible say, obey your, those that have the rule over you, obey, meaning authority, obey your employer, your boss? Yes, but this is not the time to obey because they're causing you to go against God. And your heavenly master, your big boss, said, don't do such and such. So this is why Joseph once caught by the garment, she grabbed him by his clothes. And Joseph just took off. 
and the, the, the clothing, whatever piece of clothing it was that was left in her hand, Joseph says, I'll explain that later if I have to, but right now I'm out of here. So he's avoiding the, the, the uh, circumstance that could lead him to commit adultery, and that only means sex with a married person, or fornication on his part since he wasn't married. He's avoiding it completely by running, and we're told in 1 Corinthians 6, 18, flee fornication. It doesn't say begin to explain your religion, casually walk away, give excuses, girl, I'm flattered, but I can't. If there were different circumstances, you caught me any other time, uh, if you weren't married, girl, you don't know. It doesn't say do that. It says flee, but she's going to think I'm weird. Let her think she, you're weird. She's trying to coax you to sin against God or he, whatever the circumstance is. And don't con misconstrue what I'm saying here. If you have been involved in some sort of circumstance where you were forced, that is not your fault. But I'm talking about when you give into coercion and you give into alluring and, and someone uh, subtle, subtly uh, uh, convinces you to commit a sin with them, whatever it is. I'm not speaking of when someone has assailed you and it's not your fault. The Lord knows that's not your fault. You understand what I'm saying? So I don't want anyone that's been a victim of this to feel somehow that you're being preached against. No, we're talking about when you have choice to either stay there in sin or flee and suffer the consequences for doing right. The Bible makes it clear. Make it up in your mind to respond to God and do the right thing. Don't be available. Get out of there. First of all, recognize this is wrong. And you saw that his first thing was to tell her, listen, I love my God too much in so many words. God has blessed me and your husband in this house. He doesn't even think about anything in this house, all that he has. He doesn't even know how much he owns. He put it all in my trust. There's no one in this house with more authority than I. The only thing in this house that I don't have authority over, ma'am, is you because you are his wife. So Joseph, that was the time to talk because she hadn't touched him. Then day after day after day, she's hounding him. Finally, he's confronted with sin, and it's unavoidable. It's either go on and have some complacency, complacency in this sin or flee, just run. Let them call you weird. Let them call you whatever. But what am I doing? He's honoring and responding to God. He knows my whole life, even though I'm in slavery, my whole life is blessed because God is with me. And God was with Joseph everywhere he went. And we'll see when he gets to prison even, everything he does. God is with him and God blesses, makes him successful, makes him to prosper. Because this is a principle we have to learn today as Christians. Even though God is with you, even though God blesses you in circumstances, in many circumstances of your life, he also may allow you your own kind of slavery. That is to say, your own kind of suffering. Who has had a jolly, perfect life where nothing, I'm talking about the people of God, where nothing ever went wrong? Name one. Even Elijah, who was taken up, look at what he went through. Suffered uh, uh, torment in his head because he was afraid after Jezebel said, I'm going to kill you. So no one has a completely uh, stress-free, uh, problem-free life. But still, the Lord was with Joseph. None of us is going to experience a life where you're not challenged. And Joseph now, I'm sure many would have said to him, as many people say today, man, I think I'd have just said, listen, it's the boss's wife. I'm sure she was probably pretty. I'm sure you know, who can blame, hold him guilt, uh, guilty? Uh, he was just doing what his boss's wife said do. That's making excuses for sin. He didn't do that. He took responsibility. Joseph said this would be great wickedness and not just sin against Potiphar or you, ma'am, but this is sin against God. How can I do this? God's blessed me too much. I owe him too much. So his conscience was always aware that God is with me because he kept taking it back to this is a sin against God. This is great wickedness. You know, you can't have another man's wife. Like, you can't have another man's property. You can't even covet another person's property. That's another thing, saints. Think about this. When you look at someone else and their property or their husband or their wife or their car or their life or whatever, and you covet it, and your, the Bible says, don't covet anything from anybody. You've sinned against God. Even, I know you look, some people look at these um, 
these, uh, I can't just blame it on rappers, these modern videos, and you see these, and you say, look at those sinful people with all of that wealth, and how are the, how's God blessing them with all that? And you sit, and you wonder, and you sit, oh boy, if I had that yacht, oh man, if I had his wife, if I had his, her husband, if I had that lifestyle, and God is saying, didn't I tell you don't covet anything from anybody? God makes people rich. God, when I say makes people, he allows whoever is rich to be rich. He allows whatever position people hold in life. God is in control. Haven't we been over this often enough? God allows whatever it is that is happening. But one thing I love about Joseph, while in slavery, he's aware I'm honoring my God. I'm being blessed. This man, my boss, my master, Potiphar, he and all that he owns is being blessed. And I am not going to satisfy myself and displease my God with some momentary pleasure in the flesh with this man's wife, who I know would be wrong to lie with. So I will not lie with you, uh, my boss's wife, because it's wrong. Neither will I steal. Neither will I dishonor my parents. First of all, I'll have no other God before God. I will not take his name in vain. Anything God said don't do, I won't do. Because I'm taking it to God. I'm responding to God. I'm taking responsibility for my own actions. I'm not making excuses. I'm recognizing sin for sin. And then I'm willing to suffer the consequences of my uh, standing in my own integrity and standing up for the principles of my Lord and my, and my God. And look at how it goes on. Uh, I'm at verse uh, 13. Let me start here. And so it was when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and fled outside, uh, that she called to the men of the house and spoke to them, saying, See, he has brought into us a Hebrew to mock us. Now she's telling the, her other male servants, See, my husband brought this Hebrew in here to, to insult us and to make fun of us. He can't, now this is her telling a lie. You have to be willing to put up with the consequences for standing up for what is right. He came into me, uh, he, uh, he came into me to lie with me, she's saying. And, cr and I cried out with a loud voice, and it happened when he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried out that he left his garment with me and fled and went outside. So she kept the garment uh, with her until, her until his master, Joseph's master, her husband, came home. Verse 17. Then she spoke to him, her husband, with, these, with words like these, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you brought to us uh, came into me to mock me. So it happened as I lifted up my voice and cried out that he left his garment with me and fled outside. What she's saying is, he came in here to insult me, to make fun of me, to belittle me, to assail me, to rape me. It's essentially what she was saying. And you don't do that to an Egyptian. He's a mere Hebrew. How dare he do that to, to me? I'm an Egyptian. He came in here to mock, and notice she, back here in the other verse, she said to mock us. We Egyptians being mocked by these slave, enslaved people, these Hebrews. Now this is because she couldn't have her way. So, you have to, she's lying on him, yes, but he had to be willing to suffer that. He's standing on his integrity. And I want you to notice these little subtle things as we carry on here. And so it was, verse uh, 19, And so it was when his master heard these words which his wife spoke to him, saying, Your servant did to me after this manner, that his anger was aroused or kindled. Now this is something we have to understand here that is not said in the scripture. What is not said here is, who he was angry with. See, let's go back, saints. Please pay attention. Was he angry with Joseph or was he angry with his wife? It doesn't say, but he was angry. Now, why do I say that? Because the scripture made it clear that this man so trusted Joseph. He knew Joseph so well after working for him so long. Time is passing on. Joseph is getting older. Don't forget when Pharaoh elevated him to the second seat, he was 30. So some years went between Joseph being in Egypt from 17 to 30. So when Joseph, oh, it says day after day after day, that doesn't give us the exact time. So time has passed. Potiphar has come to know Joseph is a man of integrity. Joseph has never let me down. He has never stolen. In fact, he runs my affairs so well. I'm so rich. I don't even know how rich I am. Everything I have is under Joseph. The only thing that's not under Joseph is my wife because she's my wife. But everything else Joseph has the authority over, and he does it so well. I trust him so much. Am I amplifying? Yes, but this is also inferred. 
that he trusted him so much that the only thing I have to worry about is, am I having two eggs for breakfast or three? Am I having roast beef for dinner or chicken? And the only thing this man worried about is what he's eating. That's how much, please pay attention to what this is saying. He trusted Joseph so much that he didn't even have to worry about Joseph assaulting, mocking, assailing his wife even. I don't have to worry about anything in this house except what I'm eating. Clearly the inference is that he even trusted Joseph to be alone in the house with his wife and run everything about his house. So when it says he heard the words of his wife and his anger was kindled, the scripture doesn't tell us or make it clear who he was angry with. Now, did he throw Joseph in prison to preserve his wife's honor and integrity because she is an Egyptian and he's a mere, Joseph's a mere servant, a Hebrew, who they look down on? Or did he know in his heart, well, that's my wife and she probably did it before, but I have to do something since she is an Egyptian, she is my wife, uh, throw Joseph in jail. The scripture doesn't tell us that, but it just tells us his anger. People infer, well, he was angry with Joseph. Think about it. Why would he so quickly be angry with Joseph when it seems he trusted Joseph more than anyone else in his life? He didn't think about anything about his life. He's so, who do you trust with your life like that other than God? This Potiphar so trusted Joseph with his life that I'm sure it shocked him when his wife said, but he tried to rape me. And he's, he's, he's angry, but we don't know at whom. So that's, a, that's an important note to note it, the important thing to notice here that it says, all it says is in general, and his anger was kindled or aroused. So yes, he was angry, doesn't tell us against whom. Verse 20, then Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were confined. Now, as I stated, it doesn't tell us who he's angry with, exactly who, with, with whom he's angry, but it is clear that Potiphar feels he has to do something, whether it's the shame of his wife saying uh, that she was raped and he does nothing, but would it bring him shame or dishonor to his? And we must understand the Middle East, and especially back then, even now. There's not the same sort of mores or values that we, although that we may have today in the West or even in the modern world, but honor was such a thing that it was taken for granted that if a woman said someone tried to rape her, you just took her word for it, especially if she is the boss's wife. So uh, we may look at it today and say, well, let's give them a fair trial. You didn't consider that back then, especially a slave versus a mistress or the female master. You did, it wasn't even up for discussion. So did Potiphar throw Joseph in prison to save face? and to keep his wife placated or satisfied? Or did he throw him in because he's angry and thought, maybe Joseph did try to uh, assault my wife? We don't know, that's not stated. But the fact remains, that's why I said, be willing to suffer the consequences for standing on your, inte your integrity. The fact remains that Joseph was ready to suffer the consequences for resisting sin. And that went all the way to being thrown into prison. Trust me, the prisons back then were not like the prisons today. The, that is to say, the conditions. They were more than rustic. They were brutal. And I can tell you this. Uh, I know of someone that was uh, incarcerated in uh, Switzerland. In a very, uh, and you would think Switzerland, one of the most posh countries on the planet today. But the prisons... They want, and, and Saudi Arabia, one of the richest countries on the planet, but they're prisons. And there's a reason. They want you to know you don't want to come here. So the prisons, you can only imagine the conditions in which Joseph was placed in uh, Egypt in this day. Very, very, nothing like you would consider today. And, and the smells and the, the surroundings, you can just imagine. He was thrown into prison for standing on his integrity, for uh, upholding the Lord and his word, and for remembering that to do that sin that he was, for which he was being enticed, by which he was being enticed, and that he resisted, he says, no, I'll ra I would rather please God than satisfy myself, my body, momentarily. So, but he says, uh, he knows, this may cost me, 
And I'm telling us, why am I saying, saying always bring the lesson to what we can glean from it today. To stand on your integrity, to stand and up, uphold the principles of God may cost you some discomfort in this life, may cost you some embarrassment. That is to say, people would have looked at him and said, man, why didn't you just go on and lay with her? It would probably been fun too, man. And why didn't you just say, it was my boss's wife? No, he didn't do any of that. He didn't even say, ma'am, you know, I'm flattered, but I really can't. Maybe under any other circumstances, if it was just, if you weren't married, boy, if it was any other circumstances, no, he didn't do any of that. He stood on his integrity knowing it's just not right. You have a husband. I'm not married. And plus, your husband trusts me. Plus, my God has blessed me with all that I have and all of my position. And he's blessed your husband and his house, your house, ma'am. Because of me. See, he's, this is someone who's in touch with the fact that there is a God. And I fear him. I respect him. And I know how much he's blessed me. I owe him. You're not going to cause me to sin, ma'am. With all respect. And I like in verse uh, 8 where he says, uh, Behold, or look, my master does not know what is with me in this house. He doesn't even know all of which I am over. He just tells me, Joseph, run my house. Run the outside, run the fields, the animals, the inside, run everything about my life. The only thing I'm going to concern myself with, Joseph, is what I'm having for breakfast, maybe lunch and dinner. Other than that, he put all of that trust in Joseph. Joseph says, God has blessed me with this because I won't sin against God. This is great wickedness if I was to do this, ma'am. Then when she grabbed him by the clothes, making it clear, you're going to sleep with me. Joseph says, oh, nothing else to do now. I tried talking before. Now is not the time to talk. Now is not the time to explain. See, but I have a God that knows it's not time for that now because obviously he could see she's determined to have her way. So what do you do? Take off and I'll suffer the consequences for doing the right thing. The other fellows in there may have said, man, you could have done it. No one would have known. And you probably enjoyed it. Joseph says, no, it would have been against God. Where can I run, Jonah, to get away from God? Where shall I flee, David? Shall you go to the outer parts? Remember the psalm? Where shall I flee to get away from God? Shall you go down into the grave? Shall you ascend to the heaven? I know you're there, Lord. If you get on the wings of the morning, shall you go? I don't care if you catch up with the, the dawning light. You can't flee God. So Joseph makes it very clear, I'd rather please God than please myself for a, a brief moment. And so he stands on his integrity and he is thrown into jail, or th thrown into prison. Then Joseph's master, verse 20, took him and put him into prison, a place where the king's prisoners were confined. Now we can all that know the story, and perhaps we'll get into the la latter part of the story another time, but we can all see God still was with Joseph. Why is he being thrown into the prison where the king's prisons are being kept? Because when the king gets upset with his butler, and when the king gets upset with his, uh, his two employees, the butler and the, uh, who was it, the chef? The butler and the chef, I believe it was. The, the cupbearer, well, that's the butler. And you know, when the king gets upset with his top two assistants, where does he throw them? Into prison. Who do they run into there? Joseph, don't you see the Lord working behind the scenes here? But I want you to keep this in mind too, saints. This is for those of you that write me and, Lord, I know, uh, Bishop, I know I'm suffering and why? And I'm doing this and I'm praying. The Lord was still blessing Joseph, but still allowing Joseph to, do, to go through a lot of suffering. Joseph is a type of Christ, for those that may not be aware. He is a, he's a figure, if you will. Joseph if you will, saved his people. But in saving his people, Jesus, didn't he go through a lot of suffering, yet was not always the Father with him? He says, I can do nothing apart from the Father. I always please the Father. I do everything that, the Father, uh, that I see the Father do. So you see the, the similarities here. Joseph is willing to suffer imprisonment while still having the presence of the Lord. We should all come to that that we are willing to suffer whatever it is God has for me in this life to suffer. As long as I know thou art with me, you shall not forsake me, Lord. And I love that resolve in Joseph way back then to know that it's better for me to please God 
than to please myself temporarily. And another thing about people who give into temporary, temporary pleasures without doing it the right way, God says, get married if you want to please that part of your life. God says, I'm not against pleasure, but do it the right way. But for those of us that are willing to forego temporary satisfaction to please God, God says to you, well done. This is what I expect from those who really hold me in awe, God would be saying. If you really hold God, God, didn't he say, be ye holy for I am holy? Well, you know what that means? Be like me. Jesus, God said, I don't sin, you don't sin. What if I have to go through something and what if I have to suffer, but I could just easily get out of it and repent later? Jesus didn't do that. Jesus is our example. Be ye holy, the Lord says, for I am holy. And everyone should be as the Lord is. Now, has any human being ever not sinned? No, only Jesus. But the Lord has allowed a way for repentance. We got that. But in this instance, Joseph was willing to put up with whatever he had to. Little did he know, perhaps he did know it could come to this, that it would involve prison. After being the number one trusted employee or slave in his, father, in his uh, boss's house, in his master's house. Everything. The master didn't think about anything. That's how much trust he put in him. Now, Joseph knew he was being blessed because God was with him. As I said, that's the key to Joseph's life, and that's the key to our lives, because God is with you, because God is with me. And that is going to help me control my thinking, my mind. Saints, I'm telling you, in preparing this message, it has helped me before I brought it to you. It's worked on me and it's helped me to resist sinful thinking more because every time I think about how can I go out and preach this to the saints and I don't live by it myself. We have to, at some point in your life, say, you know what, this, this word of God is going to control me. And yes, no matter what the consequence is, I'm going to please God. I know he's with me. I know he will be pleased if I resist. And I know it is possible the Bible says, uh, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. You know, behind all that temptation, it's the devil. He knows you love the Lord. That's why he wants you. you know who the devil doesn't, doesn't have to worry about getting? Those he already has. Sinful people are going to be sinful people. And the devil knows who he has already. But saints, you and I, we fight daily, don't we? It's a daily struggle for us. We fight daily to resist sin. And that's why you are challenged daily. Don't think you get to a plateau in your Christian life where, great, I made it. Now there's no more sin. You know when you get to that in life? When you're dead. And when you're with the Lord. Of course, you're alive in his presence and spirit. But when, you, when in this life you're dead, that's when you're at the plateau where you're no more challenged by sin. But as long as we're breathing, you're going to be challenged by sin. And here is how to resist sin. Let's go over them again. Remember these principles. Don't sin. So take responsibility. Don't make excuses. Why? Well, she is the boss's wife. No, no, no. Well, the wallet was laying right there. I couldn't help it. Anybody with good sense would have just taken that money, even though it's not yours. No, 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 no. Thou shalt not steal. Well, my mother did get on my nerves. That's why I disrespected her. Honor thy father and thy mother. If you have to, leave the room. But honor your father and honor your parents. Whatever God said, don't do, don't do. Uh, and some people just flippantly take the name of the Lord in vain. And you say, well, it's just an expression. Don't you hate that expression that you hear when people say, Jesus, mm -mm, Christ? Don't you hate that? It, doesn't it upset you? That's taking the Lord's name in vain. And you hear it in movies and you say, they say, well, I'm just acting. Now, I wouldn't even say it in acting. Because it's taking the Lord's name in vain. So the Bible says, don't do it. Right? So whatever it is, well, you have to do that for this role. Well, I'm not taking that role then. Or you have to write that out of my lines if you're an actor. I know some people think you can't be an actor if you're a Christian. We can debate that later. In fact, we can talk about it later because the Bible, another place says avoid debates. And, uh, and uh, another thing it says avoid unlearned or uneducated questions. I've learned that in my latter years too. Avoid unlearned, uneducated questions. But getting back to this, the, the, the third thing, respond to God when you're confronted with sin. Just say, you know what? How would this look in God's eyes? I'd rather suffer not having that pleasurable moment and honor God. Respond to God. And the fourth thing, don't make yourself available. Just don't be present. You know what's coming. You know at 4 o'clock every day 
she or he comes around and they try to, then don't be there at four o'clock. Do like Joseph did. Do that job at two so you're never there at four when that temptation comes around. But now they found out that you changed to two and they come and grab you by the clothes as she did Joseph. She probably found out his schedule and said, I'll get him. And she caught him. Now it's unavoidable. Now what do you do then? Well, go to point five. Just run. But you're going to look like a coward. You're going to look like you're a wuss. You're going to look like you're soft. You're going to look like you don't like, uh, like that you're not a man enough to handle the woman. Run. Let them say what they want to say. Let the naysayers say. Let them say on. You just flee. Run. And then when you run, be willing to suffer whatever it is the consequences are for resisting sin. Let me go on and conclude here uh, as we finish the 39th chapter of Genesis. But the, the, listen to this. He was thrown into the prison where the, where the king's prisons were kept. And he was there in the prison. Verse 21 again. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy. There again. And uh, he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Didn't you see that? Wherever Joseph goes because the Lord is with him, he gained favor. He gained grace or favor. So you see the same principle happening here. Wherever Joseph went, something about his way, something about him, kept the Lord foremost in his mind, and for him, that blessing came out in the, in the way that the one who should be against you ends up being for you. He stood on his integrity, and now here, even the head of the prison favored Joseph. He found grace or favor in his sight, and the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were, he said, Joseph, you're the number one hit man here in prison. I want you to run this prison for me. He committed all the prisoners who were in prison, whoever, uh, uh, whoever they were, and whatever they did, it was his doing. Joseph ran the prison. Wherever he went, he tended to move to the top and became the overseer because the Lord was with him, because Joseph kept his integrity, because he kept God first in his consideration when he acted on anything. The keeper of the prison did not look to anything a lot like Potiphar. He didn't concern himself with anything that was under Joseph's authority, but the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made it to prosper. I want you to get that. Whatever Joseph did, the Lord made it to prosper. But here's something that we all have to come to in our lives. I'm going to do God's will. I don't care what I have to suffer, what people think of me, how I'm ridiculed. I'm going to keep in mind that there's a God that's greater than any earthly power. There's a God that I'm not willing to sin against just to please earthly authorities. I don't care what the consequence is. I'm going to look at Joseph as an example, which was given as Romans 15, 4 tells us, as 1 Corinthians 11, uh, 10, 11 tells us. Those examples in the Old Testament were given for us to learn from, that we through patience may learn to overcome and, and pursue a life that pleases God. I'm going to remember this too. And as I'm concluding now, saints, I'm going to remember this for the rest of my life. Just like Joseph, but even more so, I know now in the New Testament, after using Joseph and all the Old Testament examples, I've learned this, that the Lord gave Paul this for me. You have to speak for yourself. The Lord gave Paul this to tell me. I don't care what happens. I know if they throw me in prison, and saints, believe me, We've been through a lot. Never think that you're not going to suffer in this life. And we suffer at the hands of evildoers. I still do. I've, I have uh, forgiven those who still uh, assail me, as uh, <laughs> what she said, still mock me. I still do that. But I know this, and I keep this in the back of my mind. No matter what I'm going through, God is with me, and I'll never, ever be separated from him. I keep this in my mind. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate, separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I made that my resolve. That's how I'm able, through the grace of God, and I pray and hope that we all are, able to keep on in this life and put up with whatever it is God allows us. Some of you write me about unfortunate diagnoses. Some of you write me about impending death. Some of you write me about lack of employment, housing, whatever your troubles are. Keep this in your mind, Joseph, that no matter what the Lord allows you to go through, whether it's prison, imprisonment, whether it's uh, 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 mocking by the world, 
whether it's a, a lack of finances, lack of love. Some of you write me about wanting a spouse. Pray, I say, that the Lord gives you. If it's his will, always pray the Father's will. Whatever it is, though, that the Lord allows us to go through, even in this time of COVID-19, and some have contracted it, and we pray that God would be with you and protect those who haven't had it, but we pray and know that whatever we are allowed to go through, I don't care what it is, nothing is going to ever make me separated from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. No matter how much sin I'm confronted with, I'm going to overcome it, I'm going to resist it, I'm going to flee. I'm going to resist sin and resist the devil and he will flee from us. But I tell you this one thing, keep this in the back of your mind as I conclude right now. The Lord will never leave nor forsake those who really love him no matter what he allows us to go through. God bless each and every one of you. Please review this again and learn how to resist sin. Peace be unto you all. God bless each and every one of you. Pray for me, my brothers and sisters in Christ.